Welcome to episode 20 of Talking Prisoner. We're very lucky today. We have an international director who directed over 19 episodes of Prisoner, one being the second episode ever to go to air, directed the Great Tunnel Escape episodes. He was a great friend of the late Graham Arthur, who directed episode one. A guest then went on to direct some very big shows in the USA, such as The Practice, JAG, The X-Files, Battlestar Galactica, and Saving Grace. He's worked on many iconic Aussie TV shows, such as E Street, Neighbours, The Sullivans, Matlock Police, The Box, and Division 4, and many more. We are lucky to have him with us. Welcome to Talking Prisoner, Mr. Rod Hardy. That's, that's amazing, you know, because I only look 42. <laughs> I've done all that work. I can't believe it. <laughs> well, you're actually five yeah. years younger than me. <laughs> serious. Nice to see you both. Welcome. Nice to see you too, Rodney. How are you? I'm, I'm actually pretty good, apart from the fact, you know, as you all know, being here in Melbourne in lockdown, I got back from the United States uh, a year ago this week, spent, spent a couple of weeks in uh, quarantine in, in a hotel there, and then another month or so in uh, Sydney catching up with contacts and friends, etc. So I've been in Melbourne since really January, and I feel like I've been in lockdown ever since I got here. And I was in five months self-isolation in a way in, in Los Angeles, because all the restaurants and bars and various things were closed and you could only go get to know the checkout chick at the supermarket. So I just feel like I've got used to myself a hell of a lot more. I oh, see so you experienced COVID over in the USA. Well, I, I actually was here in uh, Australia last year, uh, flew, flew back to, um, to home as it was then, uh, early March, and that week COVID became the event. So everything slowly but surely started to close down. Wow. I might say it was, it, was, it was the COVID situation and the politics of the country that made me make the decision to come back to my real home, which is Melbourne. And what's it like being in two weeks quarantine? What, what's that feeling like? Well, it seems like it's luxury now that I've been in Melbourne, for God's sakes, you know. I mean, the two weeks was interesting because... I, I, I managed to get moved from a, a, a normal hotel, which was just terrible. I was in the basement and I was next to the dumpster and there was no natural light. And I complained enough that I finally got moved to, a, to a, 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 another hotel and, and an apartment that had a small balcony. Not because I was anybody famous, I can assure you, but I'd just come out of surgery for my eyes. And I said to them, if my blood pressure goes up, this won't be a pleasant thing for anybody. And they just realized that they should put me into a hospital hotel, uh, which was damn good. But you know, it was two weeks of not having communication with anybody apart from the people that would turn up at the door looking like they were from some strange science fiction movie, uh, twice a day, leaving brown paper bags with horrible food in it. Um, but, but I managed to cut um, a, a music clip for the late Max Merritt uh, while I was in lockdown. My editor was in, in Brisbane and I was in uh, Sydney, of course, but it gave me something to do. Which, and, I, and Max was a dear friend and I'd shot the, the, um, the piece just before, or sometime before I left um, LA. And because it was being made for no money, we didn't have an editor who would do it for no money. We finally found one in Brisbane. So I got to do the, the video clip and um, the unfortunate thing was I showed it to Max and he loved it. But I don't know how much he loved it because three days later he passed away. Um, I try not to take responsibility because he was such a good friend, but uh, I'm delighted that he got to see this clip of, um, of, his, last, um, of his last song. So it was a, a real honor. Wow. Amazing. And where will that be? Are you going to put that up on uh, YouTube or one? Oh, mate, it's on. Uh, I, I don't know where it is now. That it was handed back to the people. I think. I think Chuggy uh, from Australia here has seen it, and I think it's ended up on YouTube somewhere. It's it's a very simple clip, and it will show Max in his form. Um, he, he toward the end he was on dialysis, you know, three four times a week, and so he was challenged and struggling. And during the the actual sh um, shoot of the clip. Um, there was lots of breaks while he's had to sit down, but it shows it, it's kind of a, a recollection of Max Merritt's life. Um, and it is on YouTube. Um, and um, I hope, hope people like it if they get to see it. So I said, it's a very simple clip, but it's, it's, it's made with love by a lot of people. 
I'll check it out and we'll put a link up at the end of the interview too. Terrific, good. Um, I, know, I know all the prisoner fans will be itching for us to get into prisoner, but first, can we just learn a little bit of you and your life growing up as a child? If you can remember back oh then, my God. 40 years ago. Oh, my God. Um, I, I was born in Melbourne. Um, I went to Lee Street State School in, in Carlton uh, with, with uh, um, Dennis Pagan, um, you know, the football, now racing gentleman, and a bunch of others. He then followed on to Collingwood Tech, and I ended up at Collingwood, Collingwood Tech as well. I was raised in Fitzroy, so it was alleyways and, and um, hiding behind people's fences trying to learn how to smoke uh, or, or drink um, was my lifetime in Fitzroy. Um, but it gave me the chance. Uh, I had a great love for radio, and um, there was nobody else in my family who had uh, any connection to the entertainment business apart from my grandfather, Joseph Hardy, who was um, a world champion uh, uh, tenor, cornet player, cornet player in, in the Newcastle Steel Band. And uh, he would travel the world with this band and uh, do a, sol a solo performance. Um, and um, so he was the only entertainment person in the family. Everybody else was carpenters and electricians and plumbers and whatever. I ended up at Collingwood Tech. But the key to it was, which is when I first met Ken Mulholland, um, I, I was a very young person then. Um, and, uh, but I used to go to the Regent Theatre, uh, which was across the road from where I lived in Fitzroy. It was a wonderful movie house. And I loved the experience of when the lights would come down um, and up with the screen would, would come these images that I had a sense I wanted to be part of it. And I didn't know what that meant. Radio was in my head, but I just wanted to do something with the entertainment business. So after the, um, the uh, theatre was uh, closed down and Channel 7 bought it, the, 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 the tele-theatre appeared. And there I was as a young man at this stage at, at, at uh, Collingwood Tech, probably 12, 13 years of age, not even that. Um, I managed to go across there to watch rehearsals. And that gave me an interest in television itself. And I was able to watch all these guys. Um, Ken, I don't know if you remembered, but you know, uh, 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 John, John Hattie was there, I think in those days, wasn't he? Graham Arthur was there, Bob yes. Gardner was there, and you yes. were there. Yes. And if I, I remembered was. rightly, you were pulling cables. Yes, I was. There That's you go. So I, I would sit back and watch all these guys do their work. And um, my love from radio went then into television itself. But what I did was I took it into radio. I went and after I left school, um, uh, university was not for me uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but I went to the School of Life and ended up at 3AW as, a, as a, oh, really? an office boy and, um, and, and worked in the days when people like Norman Banks would wear suits and dinner suits on, on radio doing the news and doing various shows. So it gave me a good understanding again of music and radio and et cetera. And then I went on to 3AK and the good guys um, and um, enjoyed that experience of life and, and then ended up at Crawford Productions. Wow. Yes, you did get a job at Crawford Productions. Um, just going back uh, one step, Matt, uh, I know it's your question, but um, tell us about a little bit about your brother's eight millimeter camera. Oh, goodness. Yeah, fabulous. I mean, in a sense, that got my interest in film itself. I had no clue how to operate this camera, but I would steal it. And if, you used to wind them in those days. You'd wind them up um, so because it was, wasn't really battery operated. Um, but I would steal them and I'd go and do little short clips of silly things with my mates. We'd go to the beach and dig a hole, two holes, eight, ten feet apart, and somebody would get into the hole and stick their head out one end and somebody's feet would be at the other and it would look like somebody was like 20 feet long. I thought that was really clever stuff. Um, but it just got, and, and, then, and then I realised the more the camera ran down, the faster people would move. So I would start to use that as an effect and, and do silly things. My mother was good enough to keep all those silly pieces and uh, my, my son has uh, transferred some of them now to DVD, so at least we can hang on to them for a moment. They are very simple, very basic, but they gave me an understanding again of, of that um, flickering light that I used to see at the Regent Theatre. Tell us about Crawford Productions. 
Well, I went there and um, got a job as a, um, and I remember, remember the, the first meeting with Bob Pascoe, who was the general manager, and they were doing concidial verdicts. Um, uh, homicide was operating, Hunter was operating. And uh, I had a meeting with him and another guy called Ken Dickinson. And Ken and I were both from radio days and we were get, there were two jobs available. One was a sound recordist on the outside scenes, as they would call it, the film scenes. Um, uh, one was to be the sound recordist on that. And the other one was to be a music editor on um, Homicide and Hunter. And um, I looked at Ken and then I realised that I had no clue. And plus, it would be too bloody cold to be out there in wintertime on the, on the location. So I said, I'll be, the, I'll be the music editor. And I got the gig. So that's, that's truly how I got the, the moment. And I, and I, I loved it. It, it. Just being able to take music and create and add to the illusion of drama. You know, whether it be a, a scene of romance or a scene of, 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 of murder and angst. Um, and edit music and listen to it and find how you could splice it. We used to record it onto quarter inch tape, mark it with a little white uh, pencil uh, when we, and then move it around to hear the trombone when it started. So we could cut that to the drum beat that was probably two minutes before. So it was editing and getting used to what drama is about. And, um, I, I, and they were great, but it, was, it got me to understand about people in this business their family in a long and and we see some of them uh, often and we see and we don't see a lot of them for a long time but when you do there's a lot of stuff that comes back yeah. so it's it's, uh, it's been terrific so at Crawford's I was a music editor <clears throat> and then I went through the stepping stones to being a director um, and that all happened I became a director by the time I turned 21 I decided to get married at that time too, which is a wonderful thing to do, but being a director and being married and all those things became an interesting crisis of life. But I learned more about myself and, um, and, and managed to uh, see what the television industry was and what um, filmmaking was about. And I worked with some really good people. I enjoyed a lot. Going back to Crawford's for a minute, what was Hector like? Oh, the boss was a, he was a treat. They were, an, they were a fascinating family. I mean, they were a dynasty without question. And, and, and they had produced the first television, non, drama television in Australia. And things like Concidial Verdict and, and all of those things, they, they came out of radio plays and radio uh, productions. D24 was the radio production that made uh, Concidial Verdict, if I remember rightly, which led us on to Homicide and everything else. So this family of, um, uh, you know, led by Hector and Dorothy, um, they kind of took you into the family again. Although you had to go and wash Hector's car and pick up his chickens and then deliver Dorothy's whatever she may require of a laundry, um, we did a bit of everything for the family. And yet you got a chance to drop into the studios and watch people working. And that just made me more determined to keep going in this, in this sort of environment. Wow. Okay. But they, he was a great guy and, a, and, and I have fond memories of him and Ian Crawford and although there was challenging times with dear Ian and he knows it, but they were, they were great times because you were put right on the line and given an opportunity that a lot of people wouldn't have had. I didn't do film school. I did Crawford school. I learned the craft from other people with more experience than me. And, and I saw the pains and the, the disasters and I saw the lives fall apart after a screening of a first cut. And I started to learn that this is an emotional ride we're on. So um, I, I enjoyed my time at Crawford's a lot. Wow, fascinating. I'm surprised there's been a movie made about the Crawford's. <laughs> You know, we talked about doing a TV, one of those things that they used to do. You know, they've done the Packers and all those things. Um, it never quite came off, but they're, they're a colourful family. I think it's probably a thing of the past now that um, the, the, the majority of audiences don't even know what homicide is, yeah. which is a real shame because it is a part of Australia's television history. Um, but, but no, that, there, there's some good things and good stories of Crawford's. That's another uh, uh, conversation. Part two. <laughs> um, you're involved as a unit director, assistant director, and a director on a number of well-regarded productions such as Division Four, Matlock Police, The Sullivans, Chopper Squad, Skyways, Young Ramsey, and Cop Shop. Also, The Box in 1974. 
how did you get the job as director on the box and what were your thoughts of, uh, of the box? Well, it's more how I got the chance to be a director was the trick at Crawford's. At the time, I'd gone up from being a music editor and then I, beca I became an assistant. You, you, I think it's been listed as a unit director, but in fact, I was an assistant production manager. I worked with Jan Bladier, who is, one of, who is a producer, and I'm working as a partner in a project with her and her husband, David Lee, now. But I was an assistant production manager. Um, I didn't really have any interest in this. I just got into it because they said, that's what you're going to do next. And the Crawfords, that's what you did next. And then I became an assistant director. Um, and um, as Simon Winsor, who's a director, would say, one of the worst there ever was in the business, uh, that I was the worst. Um, but it gave me, again, just more. I just wanted to take aboard all this information of watching other people work. And so I, I, I had a friend who was Ron Neat, who was working as a blocker. You know, those days of, of television, homicides and division fours, the exterior scenes were shot on film because they didn't have video cameras that could go outside. So they were shot on film. The actors didn't have any dialogue because the director who was directing those scenes was considered more the action director. Uh, so that all the running down alleyways and driving up streets and things was done by the outside director. And then there was a studio director which took on three people. It was the blocker who would, was the job that I had, finally took over and you would block the scenes of the actors, tell them where, where you'd hear the rehearsal of the running of the lines and you'd worked out where they would stand. And then you had to work out what cameras would cover them because you had four across the open set. So it was really like a, a jigsaw puzzle of um, putting things together. Ken will tell you that one of my specialties would be, I put down camera two follow. I didn't want to write down the whole, start on the apple, pan to the window, come back. I would just, and, but I'd know in my head what we could achieve. And I also had great um, confidence in these guys. Honestly, the guys at, at both seven, nine and 10 in particular, Channel O, they were just, some were really talented uh, and there were those big bloody cameras you know on pedestals that they would zoom and push around like nobody's business so um but I got the job of um of directing because a buddy of mine Ron Neat didn't want to do it he didn't know how to talk to the actors and I was integration director I was editing the tape at the at the various channels and adding music in over the scenes that had studio from the interior and I would, um, and he just said, well, can we swap jobs? And we didn't ask anybody. We just did it one day. I turned up at the, at the rehearsal room and every, nobody sort of paid any attention. I just started to do it. <laughs> so I, beca I became a director that way, <laughs> which was, I, that was my blocking experience. And then from being a blocker, you got the chance to be a director because there was a vision switcher in the studio who would flick the, the, the cameras from one to the other that you've written in the script. There was a dialogue coach who was or called the producer who would do all the performance work with the actors. Um, so I sat between two very talented people, Ted Gregory and Ian Crawford as the Vision Switcher directors, and then various people like Brian Crossley and Mari Trevor and wonderful people who had been actors who knew how to converse with actors. And so I learned from, for two years I had that job, I learned that whole process of communication. And uh, then I got the chance to be a director on my own and it scared the living daylights out of me. <laughs> there, are a of that, names, there are a couple of names that come to mind, uh, Sonia Borg and John yeah. Jacobs. JJ. Oh yeah, Johnny Jacobs and yeah, exactly. No, there was a, there was a whole range of good, solid people who had um, had come either from the theatre, from writing the writing world, or whatever, who just came together to make this one piece of television, whatever the show was. And um, my first um, directing was in fact on Division Four um, at uh, at Channel Nine. Um, but yeah, Johnny Jacobs is another great guy. And, we, and look, some, none of these people now that are still alive, we're still friends and we catch up occasionally too, so it's fun. It is fun. George Mallaby um, comes from uh, my, my remembrances uh, from Homicide, but also appeared in The Box and later on Prisoner, Lois Ramsey and Judy Nunn also on Prisoner. What are your memories of them? 
I felt like they were aunties and uncles. <laughs> I worked with them on so many different shows. And there they were again on something else, like Paul Cronin. Paul Cronin and I did Sullivan's because I did the second episode of Sullivan's. And then we did Solo One together and we were friends until his passing. Um, so it was just wonderful to have these very talented, very good people as part of my growing up years. I mean, how lucky were we? to be involved in a business that was so fresh and new in so many ways uh, to, to, to be part of a big family. Oh. Can, you, can you just, I know, I know we weren't talking about the Sullivans, but can you just quick, uh, share like a quick memory of Paul Cronin? I mean, he was... So oh, dear Paul. Uh, I have many memories of Paul. Um, you know, uh, he, he was the salt of the earth. He was the, the real Dave Sullivan. Um, the wonderful thing that, you know, Ian Jones and Hector Crawford and Terry Stapleton and all those people did putting the shows like Sullivan's together, they cast well. Um, and I think what they saw in um, Paul, who was a country man, who was born and raised in the country, he was the salt of the earth personality and he knew that that worked. And then you stick someone in like um, Lorraine Bailey who was just filled with beans and life and, and uh, really part of the entertainment business as an actor. She gave balance to the family in the 40s. You know, she was the mum you wanted to go and tell um, the, the stories that you wouldn't tell dad. Uh, so Paul, Paul was a good man. Paul was a very good man. And, um, and uh, when, when he uh, passed, it was, a, it was a great loss. Yeah, definitely. Um, 1974, you were shooting black and white, and then late 74, everything changed to colour. Was that a big difference? Shooting <laughs> I remembered I was directing Matlock Police at the time, and the big difference was I heard that there'd been some changes. The, cam the new cameras had been tested, and they're all working fantastically, and, and, and uh, I, I didn't see anything. I, I got a few tests shown to me, but nothing more. And then I walk into the studio, and, the, and suddenly the filing cabinets were red, <laughs> and all the folders on the desks had different colours. So the art department were the first real impact. The wardrobe was the same. You know, they had red ties on and bright um, various other things that you would, uh, so that the colour could be accentuated. Um, th that, it, it was, a, it was a, a big change for about 20 minutes. And then suddenly we realised we were in exactly the same place we were yesterday, which is we had a drama show to produce. It, there were technical issues along the way. Lighting, you know, took another journey because suddenly colours were too dominant within a shot and you had to move stuff around so that the red chair wasn't quite as dominant in the shot because it was affecting where the actor was and all those things. But really, we just got on with our job again. Colour was just another big shift and was more for an audience than it was, you know, for us on the day. Well, speaking of um, Matlock Police, um, there's a story that you actually appeared in front of camera um, as Gantner brother number two uh, on Matlock Police. And the episode was titled The Moment of Truth. Any, any uh, truth in that? Oh, goodness me. You know, I, I think it was, I was labelled as drunken teenager number one. Um, <laughs> it, was, it, was two, it was two brothers, the, the Gant, um, thank you for the memory of the Gantner brothers, two brothers who were at, at night time in the middle of the bush, of course, Matlock was done and was supposed to be in the bush. There was a little old lady in the house and we would stand outside making weird noises and like we were ghosts and various things with flashlights, if I remember rightly, were under our faces. It was my first acting job and Marek Konevsky, his name was, was a director who'd been brought over from England. Crawford's at one stage decided that the people in England were much better at directing than we, the people in, uh, in Melbourne were. Um, so they brought over three of them. And there were some interesting stories about those people too, but there were some very, there was some, there was, there was some talent. There was some madness, but there was some talent. Mary Konevsky went on to be a very, very talented director and did several wonderful films back home in England, but he insisted that I play the role. And I didn't want to do it, but I eventually did it. And I didn't find I got the buzz from it. You know, it didn't suddenly turn me into another part of the career, but I did it and it's on film and my, my kids love pulling it out every now and then and having a laugh at me. It's not a big performance and I'm lucky that I even get a credit, I think. <laughs> 
That leads me into my second acting and my only other acting career was on a, buff a series called a mini series called Buffalo Girls with Angelica Houston. And, and I ended up at the very last day we're shooting in Bath in England and uh, CBS executives were all over the place because this was a really huge production and it was going through the roof because they had decided that for an $18 million budget they had uh, initially done, that it would be done for 10 million, but they wouldn't change anything in the script. So they just proceeded along the journey. So it was a bit of a challenging ride, but we did it and we shot it in two countries and in Santa Fe and everything else. But I remember on the last day of the shoot and I'm going, thank God this is finished. And there were executives everywhere from CBS and there was a knock on my door and it was the, the a costume designer. And he said, um, this is your outfit. And I said, what outfit? And it was, a, you know, one of those sort of looks like Sherlock Holmes, you know, the cape and the, the hat and whatever. It was for the the detective that had that had arrested Calamity Jane, played, played by Angelica Houston, and he was going to lock her up in a cell. That's all the scene was. And I'd cast somebody, but Angelica Houston had decided I had to play the role. Oh, wow. And I said, no, I wouldn't do it. And, and then I was told she won't come out of her trailer until you put on the costume. Oh, that was so you. I did. That was you. That was, <laughs> it's a, oh, you remember that, Rob? That was me. Oh, Oh, did you? <laughs> anyway, so I did it. And there were probably three or four lines in it. I'll be putting this one in number nine, I said to the, the, the jail keeper. How simple is that line? I couldn't, I, I, it's supposed, I thought I'd better do it in Irish. I, I sounded like I was an Arab. <laughs> uh, I, I, and, and it was just terribly embarrassing, uh, but I did it. And Angelica thanked me for it. And then they, on the day of the actual, ADR when they had to change my voice because the accent was just terrible on the lines. I had done all the directing of the actors and I didn't realize they were all staying behind to see how I would redo these lines. An actor called Gabriel Byrne, who was an Irishman was there. Um, Angelica Houston was there. Melanie Griffith was there. And they all sat waiting for me to open my mouth. I was so embarrassed. And it, I made a decision at that time, I'll leave it to the talented people. I never, I've never acted since and I have no, no need to ever want to do it again. <laughs> wow, what a story. Uh, <laughs> uh, Matt, your next question was about music editing, but we've covered that one. So I'll move on to, you've been an assistant producer, a co-executive producer, an executive producer on programs, both in Australia and, and the US. Can you tell us what those terms involve? Ah, oh, hard work and different and a different um, person who's going to stab you in the front. Um, you know, it's just, um, you know, the, 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 uh, I've, 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 directed of course and, and that has its own um, obvious uh, uh, job um, label and then I've produced I produced a mini series of Crawfords uh, called My Brother Tom um, that had that wonderful Scottish actor Gordon Jackson who was in Upstairs Downstairs if anybody old enough can remember and and that other fabulous actor called Keith Michelle who was a wonderful singer but a wonderful actor in Australia who ended up living in uh, in England. I produced it, Pino Amenta who's a wonderful director as well, uh, he directed it uh, so that was my first job to get it as a producer um, there was no nepotism involved, but it was always talked about. My wife at the time was Valerie Hardy, who was an executive producer at the 10 Network. And she would never, every time a job came up for a director and my name was put in the mix, she didn't want nepotism to be part of it. So I was pushed to one side and I used to get so annoyed about it. So one day Hector had the, the thought that I reckon Rod would be a really good producer. We're doing this mini series. So he went to Valerie and the network and they said, yes. So I got the job, maybe it was nepotism, but I got the job as a producer. It was, I was so pleased to do it because it gave me another understanding about dealing with problems of the day um, I much prefer directing. I do like to get my hands dirty. Sitting back and watching other people get their hands dirty is really challenging for me. But executive, uh, that's, uh, so a producer is there to be able to, in television, um, support the director. 
in every way he can. If there's a problem with an actor because of various things, the director can talk to the producer about it and the producer will go along and try and solve the problem. You know, if there's other issues going on with, um, with the production, whether it be with the wardrobe department or art department or whatever, the producer could come on board and, and help solve the problem. His job really is to be a backup to the director. If, if you're a good producer, you're there to support the director's job. Um, producers will oversee and work the creative side of the story behind the scenes that the direct while he the director is doing his work so I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed the experience an executive producer in both television and film is different in, in, in film an executive producer will go out and get the financing um, he finds with, with distributors and, and all of that gets the money um, um, and and, and I, 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 I'm not really a person that, that would be really that good at financial going and getting of money, but I found that I was able to talk creatively with people with money and enthuse them enough to say that they wanted to put their money into projects. And then I got the title. Um, a a co-executive producer just means there's two of you. <laughs> there's, another, there's another bloke over here. <laughs> So, um, you know, there's many different types of personalities. Um, and uh, I think um, the best, whether you're an executive producer or a co-producer or a producer or whatever, support the director. Although a lot of people don't like to, to, to um, do that, but the director's the man on the land at the time, in the morning at 4 a.m. and at the end of the day at 1 a.m., um, whatever you can do to help his job. And some of them take, some directors take advantage of that. I'd prefer not to think I did, but I, I may have a couple of times. Um, but I, I think uh, that that's really producers are there to help the journey along. Yeah, wow. So did you uh, did you miss out on some shows because of your wife? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to say it now, but yeah, I did. Um, look, you know, at the end of the day, Valerie was a very good executive at the 10 Network uh, in drama. She was, um, she was clever enough to see Neighbours when Seven had cancelled it. Oh. She saw that it had potential and then took it to the executives, her, her bosses at the, the network, and convinced them that they should pick up the show. And the rest then is history. Um, uh, so, uh, she, and she then, uh, in co collaboration with Kennedy Miller, made all those wonderful TV movies that, um, that Kennedy Miller made, that Nicole Kidman was made famous through and everything else. So Valerie was very talented and then ended up going to the, after the Americans took over the network and she got fired. We went to the United States because I always wanted to do that. Uh, eventually, um, Valerie came back and headed the South Australian Film Corporation and put them through another journey of things. She's a very talented and a, and a dear friend. And um, um, so I got, I got jobs and I didn't get jobs, but at the end of the day, you gotta stand up. If you, don't have the, if you don't have the goods, you'll be found out eventually, you know? That's, that's what it's all about. So Australia has to thank your wife for bringing neighbors to, to 10. I mean, that's- She did indeed. And I, I don't think anybody would dispute that. I yeah. mean- um, she, 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 and she followed it through many, many seasons, many years of it. I remembered I'd get, I, I always would come in after a long, hard day shoot somewhere and I'd hear the, the neighbours theme in the back of the, oh, I'm not going to go into the living room now. There'll be another episode running. I've got to go, oh, no. Um, but, um, yeah, no, th th that's, that's true. Wow. It's only been going for five or six decades. <laughs> Isn't that extraordinary? <laughs> It wouldn't have been good if she had been, a, like in the United States, getting paid money for the whole thing. Oh, um, but, but, yeah, no, listen, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing that that show is still running, and I believe they're doing a, a sort of a rebirth of it that, as we speak, uh, which will be interesting to see what you can do with something that's been around for that long. Oh, they're doing a rebirth, are they? I, I believe a recreation of the, of the show, whether it be the sets or the, the cast or the whatever, I, that's the story I've heard. Hey, listen... It's the gossip machine, so who knows? Breaking news here. This is great. There you go. <laughs> um, there you go. Speaking of Neighbours, now let's get to Prisoner, which was an amazing show. How did you become involved with Prisoner? Um, you know, I can't even remember. The, I, I, I'd done some work at Grundy's, Glenview High and Richmond Hill and... Um, things like that. And there was a, um, a wonderful, um, and I'd met already a, a, a wonderful uh, writing couple, Ian Bradley um, and Annie, Annie Lucas, 
uh, Eddie Bradley, um, and Ian was going to be the producer on the show. And, um, and, and I liked Ian. I mean, he was, a, he was a funny little rogue in many ways, a little Tom with an accent and a, 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 almost like he had a boxer's nose. And I think that's how he lived life and, and produced his work. He was a real fighter. And I liked that spirit of his. And I don't know how the, I, I, but they asked me to do it. And, and just wonderfully so, my dear friend, uh, Graham Arthur, who we, we lived together in Sydney in an apartment because we were doing various things and we're coming from Melbourne. So we got an apartment and shared it and whatever. So we were really close friends. And Graham was directing the first episode. Um, so it was sort of was a nice feeling of getting back in with him. And then, of course, it was being done at Channel 10. And then all the guys like Ken and you know, Ray Lindsay and Bob Campbell and, and I could, you know, they're all, the names are dropping out of my head like Jeff Biggs and there's many, all, and to all the ones I've forgotten, I, and I'm not saying I've forgotten you, I just don't remember as well these days the names. But there were many of them and it just felt like we were getting the family the gang back to the gang because we weren't family anymore we'd all gone off in our different directions done our various things and now people were slowly being brought back into the gang um and that was always an interesting challenge because certain members of the gang would be a bit feistier you know they'd push you a little bit harder wouldn't they ken wouldn't they yeah. ken <laughs> um so it, it but it was still a gang you know we, it was a it was a good rough old gang so I got prisoner and, and, and that uh, I never forget, this is a terrible thing to say, and I know all those fans are out there, but I have to be honest, when I walked onto the set and I saw all those false bricks, I thought, oh my God, how are we going to make this real? Um, and, and, and much to, um, to Ian Bradley and Reg Watson's thing, they had a sense. They knew a world they were trying to create. It had to be not real like, um, like um, what, what are some of those prison shows that we used to see out of, uh, out of England and whatever, but not dark. And it had to have a slight fantasy about it with the old sliding bars and all of those things. So they knew that. I didn't see it at the beginning. And of course, you watch it now, and you you, you know why the laundry looked the way it did. <laughs> uh, and it, you know it wasn't greasy and filled with steam and whatever. It just had that sense of theatre. So um, uh, it was a, it was a fun time. And those women, just, oh my God, they were some of them were handfuls. And and the mood would change by the day. You know, <laughs> you'd see in the morning. It was an interesting time. The first. 15 minutes of before you started work, you'd go to the tunnel to see where the mood was for the day and they'd either be collectively in joyful, we're all going to do this, it's going to be a great day, or they'd be very mm, mean and ready to go, depending on what scenes they were going to do during the day too, I would imagine. By the way, that's just the crew I'm talking about. Now the cast. <laughs> The crew were the same. You'd know, you'd find out who had had that late night the night before. <laughs> who was a little grumpy about something and you could hear the little side arguments going on. But you, I heard that set fell over because he didn't do this. And all of this stuff was going, it was wonderful. But it, it, it's, it was television, you know, fantastic. Ian, uh, Ian Bradley, we spoke with uh, in, in great detail. It was great. But what was, um, what was Red Watson like? You know, Reg was an interesting character. I mean, how, what that mind had in it, because he'd come from England, having done all of those, you know, shows and things, and and then he did all the shows in all the Grundy stuff in in Australia. He took them from being a quiz show company. Um, you know, Reg had started it off coming from sporting and all of that stuff, and and they were doing quiz shows and various things, and then he got them. Reg guided them into drama, and every show that they did. Reg was the one that conceived the, the production. So, and as a person, he was an interesting, he was an unassuming, he wasn't a, a grandstander of any sort. Um, and, and if you really wanted to sit down and have a talk to him about a detail thing, he would be there loving it all. But, but, but also I tell you, he used to hand it off to the various producers that took on the show. And he, and he allowed Ian Bradley to put his stamp on that production. And I think that was important too, because you can't have two people and one's up in Sydney all the time. And I'm sure Ian had difficulties with Grundy's in that sense anyway, but he didn't show us that. Ian made the production and um, I think it shows overall. Yeah, it does. 
let's go back in time <gasps> to, a, to a certain time in Carlton where you were having a celebration for Graham Arthur. This, this memory involves a black cat and a bottle of Glenfiddich. What are your memories? I can remember the bottle of Glenfiddich. I can't remember <laughs> that. <laughs> you know what? I, I, it's all that's all starting to reveal itself around me. Did I get the cat or did you? I got the cat from you because the, the cat belonged to the house. <laughs> yes, and um, I think it was Graham's engagement party. And I do recall you making a speech. And at the very end, you said, you're getting engaged, Graham. That's amazing, Grace. That was your punchline. Well, boom. <laughs> well, boom. The cat was, yeah. was a black cat who you said, look, I don't want this cat. He's hanging around the house and, you know, does anybody want him? And Maria, my wife, happened to spot a bottle of Glenfiddich in your cupboard. And she said, we'll take him off your hands. She's very fond of Glenfiddich. <laughs> she said, it'll cost you a bottle of Glenfiddich. See, what a bad deal that was. I thought you gave me the Glenfiddich mm. and you got the cat. And I don't want anybody to suggest that I'm not a, an animal lover, I am. The cat actually was one that I think the previous people that had the house and it, it, I was I didn't have I wasn't able to take care of the cat, so it would roam around and I'd feed it and whatever. But then suddenly, and I knew that you were a cat lover, and it was <laughs> a perfect a perfect exchange. I I wished I had have got more out of it than you. You seem to get everything, by the way. We we did finish off the Glenfiddich at the house at before your you left. Thank goodness. I'm yes. glad there was a good part of the deal. Excellent <laughs> memory there, Ken. <laughs> good I, on you, mate. Amazing memory, Ken. <laughs> he has. He's got a. He's got an extraordinary memory. Fantastic. Um, episode three, which first aired on the twenty eighth of February, was written by Ian Bradley, and directed by yourself. It was a. Uh, it was an iconic episode. It was the, the first riot in Wentworth with um, Frankie Doyle and B Smith and uh, Meg's husband getting stabbed with a pair of scissors. Um, what are your memories of that episode? Oh goodness! You know, it's it's like. You, you know, again, how many years ago did you say, Ken, this was? Um, it's, a, it's a long time ago, but I, I, I go on my first instincts of something. And all I can remember was uh, I would read these scenes in the script and there were, you know, another scene of another rioting, marauding bunch of women ra running around the prison. and go, oh, my God, this is going to be a nightmare. Um, and during the shoot, it was a nightmare trying to stop everybody from talking in between the screaming and yelling <laughs> was truly difficult. Um, but it was it was good. And, and I, I, you know, I, I can, scenes come back to me of, of all, when, when somebody mentions a production, and I don't know how many I've done now of many things everywhere, but certain scenes I can see, a, if I see three seconds on screen of anything that I've done, and I, if I, I don't even know if I directed it, just a show I've turned on to, and there's three seconds, I'll know it's something I directed. So I, at that moment that you've talked about, that episode, um, very clearly, and I remember Dear Tall, um, um, Help Me, Ken, um, Jesus, the, 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 the guard, it wasn't Jared Maguire, yeah, Jer not Jared Maguire, Jared Maguire. I remember Jared Maguire and I remembered um, um, Fiona Spence and I remembered, you know, uh, B, um, Val Lehman and faces in the camera and screaming and yelling and who's going to stab and who's going to, it was really, it was a challenging two hours of television, I might say, wasn't it? Because although it still had all the elements, what, Craw what Crawfords and Grundys were doing in those days, Sullivan certainly started it, they started to push the envelope further and further with soap opera. You know, the Americans are still doing the daytime television that has the same pace and the looks and the, and what and, and here in Australia, I think Home and Away as a look is a really good looking show. Um, they, they, they do it. They push the envelope to get something better than normal. So when we started Prisoner, it was not a simple show to do. The sets weren't just simple sets. 
Um, and there were more people in scenes. And the, the more people you put into a scene, the more coverage you've got to do, which takes longer to do. And so, you know, it was, it was an interesting challenge. But we did it. <laughs> we did it. Ian also said it was at that stage Red Watson wanted off the show because it was depressing him. <laughs> I, I heard that story too. Uh, I mean, look, by the way, it was a very bleak. There weren't a lot of laughs um, in, in Prisoner, you know, um, but um, the only laugh I had was when I remembered the first time I saw the cell windows stuck on the side of the wall outside Channel 10. And I looked up and I went, are you serious? We're saying that they did fix them, I might say. <laughs> but the first time I saw them, they just sort of almost like taped these thin bars to the outside of the Channel 10 studio. <laughs> I laughed then. Um, but it was, uh, the laughs were behind the camera a lot of the time with the camaraderie of both cast and crew um, without question. And, and so many of them are no longer with us. You know, Sheila Florence and uh, Lois Ramsey and, and these others that, that just aren't there anymore. And that, that's, a, that's a real shame. Um, but there, there, there were good fond memories of uh, shooting as well as after parties and things we would have. Didn't we have a lot of fun there, Ken, at various yes, times yes, after please. the show had finished? We did. We ask everyone this, but what's a memory of Sheila that you have? Ah! <laughs> Um, I just remember Sheila with her, uh, uh, yeah, I could say her, her, her a, a cardboard handbag, <laughs> as it was called, the cardboard yes. handbag. Um, you know, she would, uh, she was a, a seasoned performer, and she liked um, her too. She what's that? Liked her stout. She liked her stout as well, but the cardboard handbag would be in the locker. And uh, I think that helped her through the afternoon because they were very long days we were all doing. And Sheila was getting on in years too. And she had a lot of scenes and a lot of uh, fairly heavy emotional stuff to do. Um, but, and she, she was a pro. She knew how to help the, help the job along a bit. But, uh, I, I, and I remember the, the interesting thing was that the, the you know, the, the, the Lizzie, voice and then the Sheila Florence voice <laughs> and then it was just wonderful to see the transform from one to another um that was good yeah she had a toffee voice a toffee <laughs> voice she um, certainly did um I think we've done a few uh, extra questions there we've, we've covered a lot of things so Matt um down to um uh, your question about the episodes that went to air in 1979. Oh yeah, just and just before that, sorry, were you on the um, when you were directing? Were you on the studio floor when directing an episode, or were you up in the? No, you know what? It, it, it was that was that was a challenge because you had, um, you know, you had four cameras, or we got down to three. Uh, that was much easier. Um, and as a director, you were there switching as well, so you couldn't be on the floor. They did eventually bring a switcher in, which just was made so much more sense. Yeah. I mean, you, you got very good at editing uh, when you were the switcher as a director. You knew what you were trying to achieve from a tempo of rhythm of editing, but um, having somebody else that you could just go click your fingers at <laughs> or clap your hands so that they knew when to take the shot. The difficult bit was the, um, you would be on the floor during the rehearsal days and you would work with the actors. You know, you would talk about the scene, you would block them. Somebody would, the blocker would come in and mark the tape on, on the floor where they would go to and you'd write it down in your script if you were clever about where people would move and when they would move. And the, then you'd have, have the shot that you would do. Remembering by this stage, you, I'd, I, I'd now become everything. Um, the, the producer, they used to have in the old days that was the, the drama person, um, that you had become that person because you could then give performance notes. The blocker, who was the person that worked out the shots and write them up in the script, um, you were that person as well. And then you're also the director uh, who was there switching. So it, it, the, the, the three jobs became one. 
and then it made it more difficult to get onto the floor. And I didn't really like that because booming out over a, a, a loudspeaker, the God, the God speaker, um, has so to some people, I'm sure it feels like there's an arrogance about that. It was, there was no arrogance, it was just no other way. And you can only give certain notes to a floor manager. Um, there are certain things that in the, because we were shooting, you know, 20, 30 minutes a day, um, there were certain times you had to push that thing. And, and I know at times I used to drive the bloody camera crews and people mad because I would just get on the thing and start talking away. And, but but it, it, it was a challenge. And I, and I think it's better now. With, I think, and I haven't done a, a, a show like um, Prisoner for so long, but I believe that they're now on, on the floor working with only one or two cameras and... Um, that must be a challenge in itself too, how they get it all done. And now they're doing six episodes of Neighbours. I don't know how they do it, yeah. truly. But I did work from the control room and um, I, found, I found that a bit difficult. Then I got a switcher. Then we ended up being given a switcher, which was terrific. Jenny Williams, uh, another dear friend, um, switched for everybody and she knew everything. She was very smart. <laughs> At knowing and, and and she would make you look good she would make changes without telling you if she knew it was never going to work so we we all grew to trust jenny's instincts so um but but so th th it's been an, an evolution of television making um over the period since i started at crawford's and right up to now which i find quite fascinating and interesting and i hope some historian is documenting it all um because it's, it's, it, it could disappear because the, the days of the homicides and things and how they were done is just so changed, changed now. Definitely. Um, my next question was, and a lot of fans also want to know the answer to this question, is you've directed a few episodes in 1979 of Prisoner, then came back in 1980, and then came back in 1981 to direct more. Is there a reason why there's gaps between directors coming on? Do you remember, like, coming on Prisoner? Um, I, 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 it was because I was going off to Sydney okay. um, and, um, and doing, you know, chopper squads and uh, Glenview Highs and Richmond Hill and all those other things. And so you ended up being a, a um, you ended up becoming by, by city, Melbourne, Sydney, Melbourne, Sydney, backwards and forwards. You ended up living in hotels and apartments in Melbourne. It was the uh, Shadow Commodore on Latrobe Street. In, um, in, in on Lonsdale Street in Melbourne, um, or the the old Melbourne Hotel, um, and then in Sydney, which is why Graham Arthur and I ended up getting an apartment together. Uh, so you'd have some home living to be done. Um, you'd go off to do other jobs. You know, we used to just stick with one company. You know, directors would stay with Crawford's right forever. Um, and then Grundy started and then they, they would sort of, some would go to Grundy's and stay with Grundy's. And then we started to cross over and, and uh, that's, where, that's where it finished. Fantastic. Did you, did you actually have any favourite episodes of, of Prisoner that you di directed? Oh, goodness me. Um, you know, it's just hard remembering them all because, you know, there were so many of them. I, I, have I, have, I have memories of moments of, of scenes. Amanda Muggleton, who I truly enjoyed working with, um, you know, um, Elspeth Ballantyne. It's more about the people, and I, and I have memories of the scenes that they were involved in. Um, so from Val Lehman to um, Doreen <laughs> to I'm trying to think of all the character names now they all brought something and there was a special episode or a special scene that that because I enjoyed working with actors I mean it wasn't just how many shots can you get in um, I wanted to tell a story I, I, I wanted to be a storyteller um, so um, to try and remember the exact episode I just I have a fond memory of one of them which was the, the tunnel episode purely because um, it, it, we, 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 they had supposedly put up this big marquee um, in the uh, prison and uh, they brought kids in to watch uh, a performance by the prisoners. And during the, the, the performances, they uh, had built a tunnel and there was going to be an escape. That was a lot of fun because it was my son's uh, school class that was brought in to be the kids oh. watching the event. 
Oh. And I never forget, and I know all the camera guys got, they absolutely laugh themselves because I would always say, now, can you just pan along the crowd from, now just stop there, hold that shot. And there was my son. <laughs> if I go back and look at the episode, I did give him a few more shots than the other kids. Um, and he was probably six at the time. Uh, now he's probably 15. Certainly, he's much older than that, believe me. We're, we're, we're in partnership on some projects and uh, he's, he's a producer himself now. And um, I'm very proud of him, Brett Hardy. Very proud of him, as I am of my other son, Troy Hardy, who's been in the business and worked around with me and, and done visual effects and everything else. The family kept, you know, we, I didn't have anybody in my family who was in entertainment. Now my boys are all part of it and have been part of it. So awesome. I'm, I'm thrilled with that. Yeah. Actually, the tunnel episode, I do want to talk to you about shortly because that's it's another fan favourite, those episodes. But the um, a lot of fans do want to know, like, what was a typical monthly cycle for directing Prisoner, as in pre-production meetings, rehearsals, locations, studio hours, post-production? Um, I think, if I remember rightly, we're on a four-week turnaround. You'd do a week... Um, Oh, God, I can't remember. Isn't it funny? I know that there was a, a week of finding locations for the exterior scenes, and there weren't a lot of those, but there was a week of preparing for the rehearsal time. Um, uh, you would shoot um, over about three days or four days the outside scenes that same week, and then the next week would be rehearsal and studio stuff. So it was maybe it's a three-week turnaround. Isn't that awful? I, I, I'm giving you false information, and somebody well, else smarter than me will... We'll it was challenged. a four-week turnaround. What did we do with the other week? We must have gone to lunch. Post no post-production. Oh, that's <laughs> the right. Oh, that post thing. Oh, that's right. Oh, thank goodness we weren't at lunch. Um, yeah, so <laughs> post-production that took it. So there are the four weeks, and that's sort of the. I think that's the general flow of it now. Even now, with uh, various shows like Home and Away and Neighbours and um, and whatever. So yeah, and and during the during the um, the first week. You were talking about the script with the script writers and, you know, trying to catch up on the previous episodes to see, you know, anything that crossed over um, and then you'd have lunch. Um, and then the second week, um, you know, you'd prepare and do um, uh, your OB, your outside uh, sequences. There'd be three days or four days and, and then you'd have lunch. And, and then the following week, uh, which was the studio week, you'd rehearse for a day or two days even, I think. And then the third day, um, you'd be in the studio and then you'd do the studio and then you'd have lunch. And then the next day, would be more rehearsals and, and then you'd do the studio day again. So it was, and then you'd get to the post-production where we did do lunch. <laughs> and we, we would then find music and with the music editor and we'd work out edits and how to tighten something up if it was running too long. And you would sit with, the various um, editors and cut it together, finish it all off. So there look was at, four weeks. Look at, look at the time. It's nearly lunchtime. <laughs> Absolutely. John, John Wood wrote some episodes you directed. Uh, do you have any memories of, of John who, who went on to great success as an actor in Australia in Blue Healers and so forth? My, my, my memories of John are re really, I mean, I remembered a couple of meetings that we would have uh, about his scripts and he was, you know, he was good. You know, he understood the story and he got into the character and because he's an actor and a good actor, he was able to get into the subtleties of various things. I just remember him as an actor. I just think he's such a, and, and still is if whatever he may be doing, but the last things that I've seen. Um, I think he's a really, really fine actor and so, and a nice guy to work with. So that was a good thing too. Yeah, he's an amazing actor. He did, he did the uh, the House of Bond, I think, or the, the special with Alan Bond. He, he played that part. Right, too. right. Yeah. Yeah, no, he's very, he's very good. Um, Fiona Spencer's another one we want to see if we can share uh -huh. a memory. He played Vera Bennett, uh, another yeah. fan. What's, what's a memory? Vinegar tits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Fiona was a, you know, she, she's an interesting personality. She was a, a, appeared at times as she is in that role, very serious, and you didn't want to go the wrong way around Fiona. But at the same time, she just loved life. 
you know, there'd be a good laugh. I never forget her laugh. And so working with Fiona and, and, and she still is a dear friend um, as, as uh, some of the others that are still with us. Um, and her, her partner, Denise Morgan was a writer and a very talented one too. So De De Denise and Fiona became very close friends of my wife, Valerie and I. Um, and so I have fond memories of not just working, but social life and, and, and Fiona and Denise bred King Charles Spaniels. Oh. And so we decided when it was time for us to be uh, parents, uh, Valerie and I, we became uh, Dinky Dyes, double income, no dogs yet. No, dogs instead. Or how does Dinky die? But I, you know that saying? Double income, no kids, dogs instead. Something like that. So we had two of Fiona's dogs. King Charles Spaniels, Humphrey and Tilly became part of our lives. And um, oh, wow. uh, we had many, many, many good years remembering Fiona and Denise through those dogs. And then they were left in the United States when, when uh, we, we left there at the end um, with a very famous producer um, who did a lot of those uh, big mini series of uh, huge note. And he, he had six other dogs, King Charles Spaniel. So they ended, ended their lives flying in a private jet around various places. Their big house in the country that he and his partner had had um, tunnels under the house so the dogs could come up in any room they wanted to. And there were steps going up to the bed. They led, led a very good life at the end when Valerie and I had both had to come back to Australia. Wow. So that was Fiona. That's a good memory from Fiona. Fantastic. Do you think it was, do you think that directing Prisoner was, was more challenging compared to other shows at that time that you directed? And you partially answered that by saying, because of all the women. And that was, that and was I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. Yep. I'm no fool. But, but there were, you know, there were personality <laughs> shifts during the month, you know? There would, be, there would be people who would be happy and then suddenly they weren't so happy. And that's what it did for me was, I learned again about, and I'm always, I, I'm still learning, Ken, still finding every day something to pick up and take with me. But you would learn about, you know, actors process or process. Uh, sorry about process, that's the American way. Actors process, it's how, and, and whether they'd be doing a show like Prisoner um, or um, Angelica Houston and Melanie Griffith on a big mini series like Buffalo Girls, um, whether it be um, Ryan Reynolds, um, as a new young actor, when I work with him on a, a movie of the week in Vancouver, or and I, I know I'm sounding like I'm dropping names. I'm just trying to throw out that I've worked with some really, really good actors. Bradley Cooper on a, on a, a series in Vancouver. Um, Michael Caine on 20,000 Leagues, which was shot in Australia. I mean, I've been lucky enough to work with a lot of really, really good actors. And they've all got a process and, and if you think about it, if you have to stick your face up on a screen and reveal your inner emotions, because that's what they are doing, if, if it's, if it's got to be painful, they've got to find the pain. If you've got to do that, you've got to find a process to get through it. So I respect actors enormously. So it was it difficult on Prisoner? Uh, you know, it had its difficulties. I mean, I, I was starting to get to the stage where I'd, I'd, I'd shot so many episodes of soap operas that you had to truly think on your feet so much. Uh, and that just became a little bit exhausting at the end of the day. I wanted to move on and do mm -hmm. something else. So Prisoner was only, only difficult for that reason, not because of the show or anybody else. I just, it was time to try something else. And so I, I decided to step over the pond and try to take another challenge and go to the United States. Wow. So my next question was about Sheila, um, which is we've spoken about, which is going to lead into Ken's next question. She played the fairy godmother in the great. Yeah. <laughs> um, over to Ken. Yeah, that was that was episode nine, uh, 165, the great tunnel escape. Um, that was uh, 1980 season cliffhanger first aired on. Uh, 1980, did you say? Goodness me, 1980, goodness me. Where did time go? 
Yes. I've done it four decades ago. That's hardly <laughs> anything. Um, that was uh, written by Dave Worthington and directed by your, your goodly self and uh -huh. Juliana Fox. Studio cameramen were Wayne Lavender, Noel Penn and myself. Um, did, you, did you have any um, memories of, of Juliana at, at the time as well? Uh, I have fond memories of Juliana, apart from her being just a gorgeous looking woman and a gorgeous heart and a good soul. Um, you know, she, she was enthusiastic and she was, had elegance about her. Um, I, and I remembered that very clearly, that she brought a dignity to whatever while she was discussing. And she was always sitting and watching and she'd ask all the right questions. So as a director, I had the sense that she could, she could truly make something of that uh, career. And then unfortunately her life um, was, was, was finished far too early. But um, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of directors that have gone on to do other things. Um, Juliana, I thought had enormous uh, talent and she knew how to work both the crew and the cast. Uh, that's that's a really interesting challenge. Other people may have other opinions of that, but from what I could see, when and and when you when it says that we co-directed something, the the, um, we, the directors at Crawford's who had been there for some time were given the opportunity of taking on this person, this shadow beside you, and they'd either been like Juliana had been a director's assistant of mine, so she had been at the, all the stages of production, the rehearsal you know, the pre-production, um, the lunch, um, the rehearsal, uh, another lunch there, I think somewhere, and then, you know, the shooting. So, and there, and there was probably a lunch there too, but she had seen it all. And so, and she was like a sponge. And a lot of the other people that came through were just like that too. So they had a chance to, to, to really get it. You know, it's, it was film school in a, in a, in a, in a, in a bottle. Whew, stick everything into one small space and see what you can get out of it. Um, put my years of experience and give it to somebody and say, do it now in three months. It was condensing the teaching program, the, the learning program. And I thought that was a, an interesting new thing that Crawford's began that's now being used quite a bit. And that's how a lot of directors today have got their, their experiences. So yeah, Juliana was special and, and, and was just fun to be around. And, and late at night when Ken was getting grumpy about something or, you know, all the others were just saying, oh shit, when are we gonna finish this? Juliana would find some way of just breaking that moment, you know, and it was, that's, the thing about this business is I've learned over the years is you've just got to find a sense of humor somewhere because otherwise it'll eat you. <laughs> um, and Juliana had that sense of humor. Wow. But you you acted as a mentor. That's or... that's really what it was. It was there to be the protector in a sense. If she wasn't able to get through to the cast, or if they felt, you know, uncomfortable with the, with the way because she hadn't directed actors before, you could you know guide her through the. She could ask, you know, I I need this from it. How could I, you know, what what should I say? But she had an instinct as well, which she used mostly. And then shots. If there was a reason why, why did you do that? Um, is, was, a, was, a, was a process with all of these training directors because then they'd have to explain why they want, what they were trying to achieve and you would say, well, that's not what the audience are going to get. So we try and rework a, sh you know, a, a shooting style, a storytelling in a different way. It was, it was, a, it was a mentoring, I suppose, and geez, I never thought about that. Yeah, it was, exactly. Wow. <clears throat> um, a lot of the fans would like to know where was the tunnel actually filmed? The tunnel was, was that in, inside the studio? Yeah, and I'm right, aren't I, Ken? It was built, because I know it was a false tunnel, of course. Um, we weren't shooting on location with that, if I remember rightly. No, we I weren't. We built, I, can't go ahead. Remember, I can't remember that, Rod. I was probably out to lunch. You were probably at lunch. <laughs> Exactly. Um, it was a, I know that they built sections of it because we also, it also collapsed and uh, you couldn't do that in a real tunnel. And of course, we didn't have the time to go out and shoot. I, there may have been a tunnel. I have a vague recollection that was a sewerage tunnel or something we used to going into it or coming out or parts of a run along or something that we did on the exterior day and then edited it in with the, um, the tunnel in the studio. 
Yes, to have that control, controlled yes. collapse. Yeah. Yes, yes. exactly. Because, you know, and we wanted, there had to be, if it was built in the studio, and most of it was, there had to be water in it too. So it was quite a, a challenging little exercise. Mm. So in, in that tunnel, we see Judy, Doreen, Mouse escaping, and Lizzie also was trying to, but <laughs> B, Val Lehman came down and stopped her. <clears throat> then the tunnel collapsed and we cut to the end of the episode. What are your memories of directing that? that actual collapse and, and so forth. Do you have anything there? Um, I, I, I remember at the time it wasn't easy because, um, you know, they, you, they had to throw in <coughs> dust and they had to throw in water and they had to throw in stuff. And so um, the practicality of shooting it and getting the moments, um, it, was, it was a little complex, but nothing more. I mean, honestly, um, no, I, it was... And I've done many other things since then that I'm glad I had the chance of doing that at that time. It may have felt big to me at the time, but I was on my process of learning. So um, it was probably everybody used to work really hard. You know, the, the crews that would come in and, and not just do camera guys, but everybody else, the special effects guys and all of that that would come in to help out to make things work. Everybody want, particularly if there was something different. They wanted to do something special, so um, it, it's it was such fun, wasn't it? You know, it was it was kind of like I get paid to do this, and then I'd suddenly realise after fifteen hours of work, now I realise why I get paid for this. It's bloody long hours, and why am I only getting ten pounds or twenty five dollars a week <laughs> to do this? <laughs> it was interesting. At the time that you were directing, um, Wynne Roberts was on the show who played Stuart Galepsi, who was sent from the department to, to fix Wentworth and he, he sadly passed away recently. Do you have a memory about him, working with him? Um, he was a, a delightful man. I didn't know he'd passed away, to be perfectly oh. honest with you. Um, and and I, I'm really sorry to hear. I haven't seen him for many years. He's a perfect example of what Crawford's created. You know, he was a, a theatre actor as was Sheila and, and, uh, and others. And, and by the way, when I say Crawford's, I, I, eventually, I mean that eventually it went through and Grundy's were doing it too. But at the beginning when Crawford's were doing it alone, they were using theatre actors. Melbourne Theatre Company were a big part of the casting process in a way. And actors like Wynne, who had, they'd done a lot of stage work. They then got the chance of doing television with Consider Your Verdict. And then they would do, uh, and D24, the radio stuff. And then all these radio plays that Dorothy Crawford used to direct. Um, so all of them were very well spoken. They were very, very well. They, were artic they could articulate very well. And there was very much like trying to be, they were English in sound. And Wynne was, one of, he had an Australian twang to it all. It was a wonderful sound. I can hear his voice now. So. Crawford's brought these people into the world of television and then they went on to do many other things. He was just a good, he was a gentle man too, a very intelligent man. And um, uh, yeah, nice bloke, nice bloke. How good are radio plays? They still play them on um, 3RW late at night, you know, the old radio plays. There. They, they do. Oh. I actually, I should, I should listen to that. Yeah. I, should, I used to work at 3RW years ago. I should listen to that because... Um, um, there's, there's, there's a quality, there's a style. I remembered standing when they had a, a horrible little studio in uh, Collins Street in Melbourne at Crawford's that had egg cup, you know, the old egg um, um, yes. things. Yes. They were all over the walls that stopped the sound bouncing off. And there was a box in the corner about that deep, about, you know, eight inches deep. And it had a big concrete block in it. It had a sand in it. It had um, shells in it. Uh, there was sound things. There, there were the coconut things you clumped together. And, and uh, that's where they used to do all the radio plays. And every now and then they would do a radio play. And while I was doing sound or something on something else, and I'd sit and watch it. And it was just fascinating to watch. You'd see these actors stand there and in bad lighting and nothing else. And they were reading their scripts, and, but they would bring something alive. 
you know that's what made me so fascinated with actors how they create a world but it has to be in them in the first place i think and then the writer brings the words and off they go and it becomes something something special yeah you listen to these plays and you, you think you're in there yeah you, you think you're with them yeah exactly and that's what you have to you have to give yourself as an audience too it's easy to sit back and criticize everything i try not i can't watch things that i've done too often because i'm very critical of my work not other people's just mostly my work why did i do that i could have done this i should but that's just me um but you know you, you got to appreciate what an actor brings to a, you got to appreciate what writers bring and what everybody brings at the end of the day, but if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. And uh, so it's a, it's a whole collective, you know. God, that's another cliche. Where do they come from? <laughs> They've been growing over decades. They're growing like a wart. <laughs> Did you actually watch any episodes of Prisoner after you left the show? I have to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't. And I didn't for a bunch of reasons. I was too busy working. And then, you know, it's been now 35 years. I moved to the United States. So then I was well and truly away. I would catch up with everybody and everything. And I, I was still very much part of an Australian mafia in LA. And I would always try and keep in touch with what's happening back here. But I couldn't get episodes of Prison or I couldn't get episodes of Neighbours or any of the other things that I'd done. Um, and the internet was just starting, so you couldn't click on something to go and see an episode. Isn't it fantastic today that we have the ability that any question you want to ask, if it's not Siri, it's Alexa, or it's Dr. Google. And then you can watch anything you want to watch by YouTube. Um, so it's a, it's a far different world and how wonderful that part of it is. Yeah. Speaking of watching things, have you, uh, and this will be a fan question, but have you watched the new Wentworth, the remake of Prisoner? I have and I like it. You like it? I, it's different. I, it's not, to me, to me, it's not a remake of Prisoner. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 a female prison uh, told with a different perspective. Just not taking away from that question, but in between Prisoner and before I went to the States, they got me to do direct a pilot uh, of Punishment, which I did in Sydney. And it was being made for KTLA in Los Angeles and then was really made to be played around the United States because Prisoner Cell Block H um, had become quite successful. And uh, so I did the pilot of that. So it was another, that wasn't a, a male version of Prisoner as people would always call it. I think it's just a bit of a cop out to just use the, the, the something before to say that's what it is now. And Wentworth has a lot better production values than we had the chance to do on, on uh, Prisoner because then they're not making as many episodes. Yeah. Um, they tackled things in, with a tougher way because it's today rather than back in those days we were being censored so many times about what they were doing. So it isn't the same thing to me and I think it is a very good um, production. I also think that Prisoner was a very good production for, for its time and, and the fact that it lives on with all the fans today is just, we're blessed. Yeah. Um, my next question we actually touched on uh, before, so I'll move over to Ken. After you moved on from Prisoner, you directed shows like Sarah Dane, Under Capricorn, Eureka Stockade, Richmond Hill, Neighbours, East Street, Return to Eden, and Mission Impossible. You really got around. Can you let us into your mind during those years before you actually went to the US? Well, firstly, you wouldn't want to get into my mind at that time. You know, it's a little murky in there. And I, I, was, um, I was searching for my, um, for my identity. You know, I, I'd come from Fitzroy. I was, you know, I'd left school um, at, at 15 um, with an ambition of something in radio. And um, um, so my education was very limited in a way other than in television and whatever. So I went from production to production, 
purely there were two reasons and the first one most obvious one is it was the way I made my living I had to earn it I had to it was my career I had to make a living but I was also trying to work my way towards that American marketplace because I watched a lot of American television as we all did as a kid and I always had that fascination of being able to get to Disneyland and it wasn't just the theme park it was the Disneyland of Hollywood and and the, and the experience of doing what I'd been doing in Australia and and hopefully keep the, keep the career moving along. So um, doing all of those productions, you know, things like Chopper Squad, um, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the, doing the action of it, a helicopter rescue. It was Baywatch before Baywatch. Um, it was it was just and great and great cast, great locations. Um, and it was outside most of the time. So what, suddenly I wasn't in a studio having to work in a control room and talk loudly to actors. I could actually be out in the monks and, and, and yell at them across the set. Um, so it was just a chance to get a, you know, and I got a whole range of production types that Australia, you know, Return to Reading was the glam one with Peter Tapano again, you know, and we were, Peter Tapano and, and her then husband, Barry Quinn and I were, and my wife were all very close. So um, working with Peter was always a treat and she's still a friend and, 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 um, and very, I'm, I'm very, very fond of Peter. Um, so yeah, that was just to get an experience. You know, it sounds like all I, I do in life is get experience, but I truly do. I've learned so much along the journey and I hope there's a hell of a lot more to come. I just want to bring up two shows that Ken just mentioned, E Street and Richmond Hill, which had a lot of cast members from Prisoner on. Um, yeah. A lot of fans of Prisoner love those two shows. Can, can you just give us a quick... Uh, I mean, E Street, you directed a lot of episodes of. I know that. Uh, I did the first episode, of the what one would call the pilot episode of, um, of E Street. And then um, um, Simon Baker was in it, and then I worked with him in the States on uh, The Mentalist. So there's been crossovers along the journey, um, but um, I, I became a, a, a producer on E Street as well at some period of time. It was not what I really wanted to do, but I was coerced into it. Um, it was there was a really interesting show, and I love the locations of Belmain. Um, Forrest Redlick, who was the producer, uh, I know he won't mind me saying this is. Um, but mad as a cut snake and, and just had a wonderful mind that, that would push the envelope on every story and whatever. And, and the characters and, and Belmain, and I lived in Belmain, Birchgrove I lived in. So I felt the village and I love what they were trying to create with that village on, on that show on East Street. Lots of very dear friends who were in the production are still friends now. So that's a good thing. Uh, Richmond Hill, I only did a couple, I think I only did, I only did two or three of those. Um, was that Paula Duncan? I can't even remember now. But was she in Cop Shop? Yes, yeah, she was Cop Shop. I can't remember much about Richmond Hill. Isn't that interesting? Had a big part on Richmond Hill. Who did, sorry? Peggy Kirkpatrick had a big part on Richmond Hill. She was the- Right. Yeah, the rich lady. Yeah, the, 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 I mean, it's really interesting. It's I, I just don't have a lot of. Uh, maybe that's when my mind was at its most murky. I think Ross. Um, I think Ross Higgins was also. Um, Ross was in it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah dear Ross, Kingswood Country, wasn't it? Didn't he do? Key? He, he was a terrific. Nice bloke. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Louis the Fly. He was the uh, voiceover for Louis the Fly. Louis the Fly, exactly. Um, yeah, it was just a look. As I say, there's, there's so many of these productions and remembering every one of them. And I, I don't think I did a lot of episodes of, of Richmond Hill, um, but, I, but I can remember again, the people that were there. Um, that's, that's always the link for me. Um, 1992, George H. Bush was president of the United States and then you went to the United States. What uh, prompted you to do that, move to the USA? <laughs> I asked myself that question many, many, many times. Uh, you know, it was, it seemed to me to be the next obvious stepping stone. I'd shot a feature in Australia back in the 70s, in the late 70s, called First. And it was, uh, you know, the 70s was the resurgence of the film industry uh, in Australia, because that, that was around the time they were making, you know, they'd made Break of Morant and the Picnic and Hanging Rock and all of those wonderful fabulous and and I made thirst 
um, and which which I loved doing. It was a it was a vampire story, and I remember going in for a meeting with Tony Ganane, who was the producer, and I'm thinking, having read the script, this is going to be a really great spoof on on vampires and I can see it and I was ready for my pitch to him and that was the I was about to say it and he said now you know that this is a very serious story it's about real vampires and I went oh there goes that pitch out the corner <laughs> of course it is so but the journey was to make a feature film which I did it in in a, in a time when they, it was just coming back so the next step was to step out and go to the United States and take a risk and, um, and 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 Valerie um, and, and my, my my then wife who who'd been with Ten had just finished at Ten and we were looking for you know, the next adventure and off to the states we went um, and uh, you know it was part of the adventure again the you know the journey of getting on with life and making changes and and I've made you know ch many changes and. Uh, I, met, I have many regrets and people say you should never have regrets. I think having having the regrets that I have uh, have made me not want to repeat them too often um, because I just I do enjoy the challenges without thinking about whether they're going to create me bigger problems later. And moving to the States was a big challenge. And um, I, 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 I couldn't get an agent uh, after all the things I'd done in Australia. Oh, wow. So, so then, um, and I'd taken a new family with me, a young family to the United States afterwards. This is the last time I moved there. So I'm, I'm combining first time, um, just let's see what America is, come back to Australia, do some more things, then decide to life's changing dramatically and always go to back to America and try it again with a new family. Big challenge. Um, and, uh, and, 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 I couldn't get a, uh, an agent. And what I decided I had to do was to get some American voices on my reel. And so they were doing Mission Impossible back in Queensland. And I had friends, Ted Roberts um, um, was, was the head on, of the script department on it. Stanley Walsh, dear Stanley, both those guys have gone now, but they were dear friends and very talented people in the writing department. And so they were working with the Americans at CBS and Paramount who were putting it together. And I managed to get, I got, came back to Australia and I got to a big dinner they were having for the first episode that was going to be coming up soon. And I introduced myself to the producers and the executives and talked myself around it and explained why I would do it and that I'm living in America. And, and then I got the chance. So I was able to take those episodes with American accents. And although it was shot in Australia, it was shot in Australia because there was a strike occurring in the United States and they couldn't work there. So they brought everything to Australia. And so I um, managed to get scenes with American voices and American actors um, on my reel. And that, that sort of started to get people interested in uh, me not just being who these Australians, they didn't understand what we were saying. Um, and they, you know, we weren't really the flavor of the month at that time. But now it's a different story. I mean, you can be a big star here and, and go and make it in America as a, as a rule. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the big change that's occurred is you can be, um, you can be a, 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 in television and do feature films and vice versa, where back earlier when I went to the States and certainly up until the last 10, 15 years, 15 years you couldn't do that. You were a feature film person or you are a television person. And, and, and sometimes now I think some of the television is better than the feature films. Yeah. You know, so, it, it, and, and actors can get the chance to show their wares. If they've had a TV series, it gives them a chance for a bit of a profile. Um, and feature film actors are getting themselves back into television and doing some really terrific work. So the, 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 the industry is crossing and fusing more. And I like, I like that. Now, I'm, I'm going to touch on some of the American shows, only some of them that you have worked on. And I'd advise and invite both you and Matt to go out to lunch while I do this. <laughs> uh, X-Files, Battlestar Galactica, Rio Diablo, Between Love and Hate, The Only Way Out, My Name is Kate, 
the yearling halfway across the galaxy and turn left, Buffalo Girls, an unfinished affair, 20,000 leagues under the sea, Robinson Crusoe, two for Texas, Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., High Noon, High Noon, Route 52, December Boys, and In Plain Sight, Burn Notice, Dollhouse, Saving Grace, oh. The Mentalist, Leverage, and the and Mental. I've done. Have you had, did you enjoy your lunch? <laughs> hey, a couple of those were Australian productions. I must tell you, the December Boys was definitely an Australian film, which yeah. I just made. That was about 10 years ago with, with Daniel Radcliffe. And, and the other one was Halfway Across the Galaxy and Turn Left was actually a, a TV series, which was the last thing that I did in, in um, Australia, a kids TV series. I did the pilot and it went on to um, a number of episodes. And that was the last thing I did before I went to Los Angeles. Um, but but yeah, goodness, when I hear all of those, I go, what the hell? How did I go to lunch? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, you worked with fantastic talent, Angelica Houston, Melanie Griffith, Michael Caine, Daniel Radcliffe. But tell us a little bit about Tom Skerritt and Pierce Brosnan. Uh, you know, th those two are the two of my dearest friends now which is just, and I, I, when I talk about this, because I'm Australian, I know in Australia, we kind of go, oh, here he goes again, but they, they're my friends and I've worked with them. So, hey, I'm going to mention their names. Um, I did a Robinson Crusoe with Pierce Brosnan in New Guinea, which had a, that's a whole nother story, but we got to, and that was many years ago, 25 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. Um, we got to know each other and still a very, he's a dear friend. And Tom Skerritt um, was in Two for Texas and then came and did High Noon, a remake of High Noon as a Western um, um, movie. Um, and, uh, you know, two wonderful actors with different processes, but very talented and very committed actors. You know, I've learned from every one of these, from every actor that I've worked with back in Australia to all of these dudes over there. I mean, and, but I think, you know, they may have learned something from me along the journey too. Uh, not not all good things, um, but but it, it it is it's been a fantastic. I've been very fortunate, you know. I, this is like this is my last performance, but I really mean it. I've been very 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 lucky to have a career that's gone on for as long as it has, and it's not over yet. You know, I've I'm having to take more charge of it myself and create the productions because um, there's been a lot of changes in the industry and ageism is one that's alive and well. Um, but, but along with that, there's diversity and a whole range of things that make it much more difficult to get the jobs. Because I'm, uh, um, you know, uh, over 45 years of age um, and, and all the other things that go in there, um, it does make it a little more tricky to get the jobs and I'm developing my own stuff. But yeah, there's a hell of a lot of um, good experiences and a lot of good life experience in all of those productions. I mean, high noon for God's sakes, why would you make it? It was a classic, but somebody offered it to me. And, and I thought about it for a moment because I'd done a number of Western movies, TV movies over there. And I, I hate riding horses, but I love Westerns because back in those days at that theatre in Fitzroy, um, I watched these Westerns up on the big screen. And that started the ball rolling in my head. So when I got a chance to direct some of them, I went, yay, I love this. High Noon was the, they were used most of the original script. So it had been made with Gary Cooper and I'd worked with um, Tom Skerritt and, you know, he's been in a lot of productions of movies and television and, and we, were, we, were, we were good friends and I love working. I said, hey, you want to be Gary Cooper in this one? And of course he jumped in and said, yes. We did the, it was close to the original script, but we shot it in Calgary in Canada Stanley Kramer, who did the original, was an executive producer. His wife was a hands-on executive producer on the production um, and, his, and his daughter, Kat. Um, but um, he shot his, I got a note from him after I'd finished the production. We shot it in, in Calgary in the beginning of winter. And the story is in, uh, in real time. One, you know, it's like from nine o'clock, 9.30 in the morning till 12.15 p.m. That's the story, and it's in real time. 
we had every, con it was shot in 19 days, and we had every conceivable weather you can imagine from day one, a blizzard, and the producer screaming, we've got to get the snow machines in because it was going to be hot in two days time. And, and I said, let's not start having to make snow because I wanted to see the hills of Calgary, the mountains of Calgary. The version they made that uh, Stanley Kramer told me about, they shot it on the lot at Warner Brothers and it was all very claustrophobic, which worked for the film because they couldn't shoot above the roof lines because there were palm trees there. <laughs> So everything was shot very tight and it worked beautifully. I thought, go the other way. If we're going to shoot Calgary, let's use, you know, the mountains. Let's use the landscape. Let's use the prairies. Let's use... And we had this western town sitting there in the middle of nowhere. So there's snow blizzards first day and I ended up shooting everything inside on close-ups and waiting and hoping it would go away. We finally got it done. And Stanley Kramer gave me a letter and he said... I don't know how you did it. We had, I think, 32 days, he said, and it wasn't enough. Um, and, I, and my figure was simple, but you made the classic. <laughs> you know, I would never compare the two productions in any way. Uh, and why would you remake a classic? It was a Western. Boys are an adventure. I wanted to get in there and try it. And we did it with its challenges. And Tom was in it. Um, a woman called Maria Conchita Alonso, who's a wonderful Hispanic actress. Michael Madsen, who's as mad as a cut snake and a wonderful mad actor, um, played the Frank Miller, the bad guy at the end. And uh, it was just, you know, a whole bunch of, it was a tough one. Had a tough producer on it. And he, 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 he was, he'd made a lot of films and he was in, in his much later years of life. So he was very grumpy all the time. <laughs> and I was trying to create this atmosphere of fun on the set. It was a challenge, but we did it. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of it as a remake. Wow. What about Michael Caine? What were your impressions of Michael Caine working with him? A delight. And, you know, I feel like I love everybody. And, and, and you know, I don't, Ken. Um, but I, I, I love people that um, have passion for what they're doing. And Michael had a passion for what he did. And, and, um, and when he came out, uh, one stage, I, he, he gave me some wor wise words of advice on many occasions, but one of them was, we talked about restaurants that he'd run in London and in, in, in um, various other parts of Europe and in, in Miami. And I said, How could, you know, what is it about it that you do that you know how to make these restaurants work? And he said, my theory is simple. If you give them, he said, and it's just like in the film industry and it's just like any meeting you have. If you give them good bread, when they come in and good coffee when they go out, they might just forgive you for the bits in the middle. <laughs> and it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? So I would use that at my meetings when I was pitching for things at the States. I'd go in and I, that's a great view you've got there. And look at those pictures of your kids. Tell me about that. <laughs> that was the good bits. <laughs> and then at the very end, you would just try and you've got to find a way. Michael was just, he had a story to tell at every moment. But his best piece of information for me and working with him was, I will do whatever you want, but please do me one thing. Give me one print take that I choose, that I can say, yes, I'm happy with that. And then I'll do as many as you want after. And that's exactly what we did. I would get, we'd go and if, I, if, I, if suddenly he would say, I would say print and he'd say, um, I'm happy and I'd say, no, I need to do another one. And then I might do five or six more. And he would come back in and just deliver the goods. But as soon as he found his part and his moment in that scene, he would say, can we print that one? And I would say, yes, of course, that's perfect. And then I'd go for what the, the, the next bit. And I, we, it just was such a good piece of advice from, a, from a, an amazingly wonderful actor. Yeah, brilliant actor. <clears throat> and there was one more, Kim, or well, that was it? Uh, no, one more. I'll ju jump in when I, when I get, to, now that I've got the chance. Angelica Houston, of course, daughter of um, a, an iconic. Um, yeah, John Houston is amazing iconic, yeah. Yeah. Um, how, did you, how, how did you get on with Angelica Houston? I mean, I've seen photographs of you and, and she together. Um, with big smiles and, and, you know, very happy. 
it was a good experience. It was a terrific experience. Um, uh, the show Buffalo Girls, as I mentioned before, was a challenging because it was a very big production, um, multi, multi, multi millions of dollar production that they wanted to do on a shoestring. And they didn't want to change the script because CBS decided they were going to finance it themselves through their production company. And that made it challenging because it, they were, you know, it was shot in two countries and it had the Wild West show with wagons and Indians and it was an extraordinary production. And I, and I really loved uh, the opportunity of doing it. And Angelica was by my side, as was Melanie Griffith, um, supporting me all the way because it was, a, it was a tough job. The executive CBS was sort of pushing all the time. It's got to be done quicker. But at the same time, they didn't want things to be changed because they knew they'd spent so much money on it that it needed to keep going. So it was a, it was a bit of an interesting journey. But Angelica was there to support me whenever something went wrong. So I, I, I respected and appreciated that, as was Melanie. They had two different styles of working, Melanie and Angelica. I mean, you know, and Angelica is she's just so majestic in so many ways because she comes from royalty, Hollywood royalty with John Houston. And I remembered we would have dark, we'd dine many times and she would tell me tales of her dad. And they were good and not so good tales, but they were just life with a strong father, but, but a man who had a career in, in, in movie history um, that, that I was ever so impressed with. So it was really enjoyable to work with her. And that particular production had a range of actors that were quite extraordinary from, from Angelica and Melanie to Jack Palance. Do you know the, 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 that wonderful actor that was in The Manchurian Candidate and a whole range of extraordinary films of you know, the boxer, the, the, the one-arm push-up man who was, he's just, Jack Palance was Western personified. Um, Gabriel Byrne, who was a, an Irish actor who'd been in wonderful productions, Usual Suspects and all these other things. Um, Reba McIntyre, who was a country and Western singer, a singer was now gonna be an actor playing Annie Oakley in the film. Um, Sam Elliott, who'd been in loads of Westerns and, and, and various things. Liev Schreiber, who went on to do other productions and married Naomi Watt and now is no longer, but he became an, a, you know, a, a movie star in his own right. There was people at all different levels of their career. So trying to understand all of their processes and also find mine, it was a challenging production, but I loved it. And I, I'm, I'm very, you know, look, there were, there were things in it I wish we hadn't have done and they hadn't have pushed on. But I love the, the, the flavor of the old West being brought back to um, now. I made a point of going and watching it. Oh, you did? It's a, it's, it's, it's a four hour mini series. I, I actually looked at it again with my, um, with my granddaughters. Uh, just in the last few months and and it was a little slow I found but but beautiful moments and good wonderful actors with some some terrific moments from their performances it was great it was a very thank, good thank you. I appreciate it thank you so you'd be a fan of the show Ray Donovan then I'm guessing I, I do like Ray Donovan how good is Ray um, the, you know the guy that, sh that shoots that the, the cinematographer who's so talented um, um, and, and and he's um he did the high noon with me. And, uh, you know, Robin McLaughlin is a Canadian American and he's got a, a visual style. And what he did with high noon, if anybody gets a chance, it's a good looking picture to look, look at. He puts into Ray Donovan and, and, um, and, other, and, and Westworld, he's done since then and a whole bunch of other things. So, yeah, I, I like, and I like Liev, he's a, he's a good, it was, it was very early days for, for Liev as an, as an actor in, television that was the biggest thing he'd done I, I've been lucky with that Ryan Reynolds was probably 17 when I worked with him on um, uh, my name is Kate it was called with uh, Donna Mills um, and and a young actor coming up um, when we finished the production he said to me what advice would you give me and I said um, leave Vancouver and go to Los Angeles <laughs> if you want to get a career going. <laughs> I just said, go and go where the market is. Jump forward, 
probably seven or eight years, I'm doing X-Files on the lot at 20th Century Fox and I'm walking across the lot and I hear this person call out and it's Ryan. And he's, he was doing a show, I think it was called Two Guys in a Pizza or some damn thing like that. I don't know what it was. Called. And he said, how you doing, Ryan? And I said, I'm good. And he said, you, you, I have to tell you, you did one wonderful thing for me. Do you remember telling me to, I should go to the United States? He said, much to my father's annoyance, I did it. And look, I've got my own show. And then Ryan just kept <laughs> stepping up, and you know, now he's um, now he's 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 a true movie star and a very funny and very good actor. Yeah, very. So good. I've been lucky working with these people at different, and I was at different stages of my career too. So um, you know they, uh, the networks dropped Ray Donovan last year. They dropped uh, it, yeah. and there was such an outcry from the fans. They did a lot. Yeah. In another season. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Show. Absolutely. It's a good show. Very yeah. good show. Speaking of great shows, I just want to quickly touch. I know we're taking a lot of your time, but the uh, the practice, which you've directed a couple of episodes of, written by David E. Kelly, who's married to Michelle Pfeiffer, another brilliant show and a brilliant writer. <clears throat> Do you have any memories of working on the practice that you could share with us? Yeah, and and um, I I did a lot because I, I I have good memories of it. Uh, David E. Kelly was a delight to work with. Uh, he was like a he had a boyish enthusiasm for everything that he wrote. And when we were doing um, the practice, Ali McBeal was operating yeah. Boston Legal or oh, Boston Public. One of those was operating, and he was writing them all. You had three shows up against each other on the same day. and and. But, but, you know, and you know what he's like, you go for the script meeting with him to his office and there was a big glass coffee table in the middle of the room. And um, he would, he would squat down on the floor at the table and you'd sit in the chair and you'd, you'd go through your notes with him and then he'd get excited and he'd just start scribbling. Well, how about this? And oh, how about his notes? <laughs> Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, he he was just he was a delight and um and and uh, and right down to the his time on the set, he'd come and the actors all respected him and um uh you know he he's a very talented writer and I was very lucky to work with him on that. I worked with him on something else and I can't remember what it is now. I did another David E. Kelly thing. Anyway, whatever. But it, it was good fun. It was good fun indeed. Yeah, wow, what a memory. Um you also directed an episode called Police State on The Practice, which starred so many brilliant actors such as Steve Harris, Ray Abruzzo from The Sopranos, Rona Mitra and James Spader, who went on to the spin-off of The Practice called Boston Legal with William Shatner. What was it like working with um, James Spader? You know, um, it, was, it was an early et episode of him in that series. Yeah. And I, the, the story was around about him that he was a little bit, he was quiet, but he's a thinker. He's an absolute thinker. Uh, but and what I discovered was he would also, when he wasn't in the scene, he'd pull, he'd have his chair put, and he'd sit on the sit next to me. He'd just sit and watch people work. Wow. And I and, and and so at the beginning it was a little intimidating because I just didn't know which way he was going to manoeuvre his way of working. But we would start chatting about stuff, and we discovered very quickly that we both love food. And we both love wine. And um, Thanksgiving was coming up. And he gave me a recipe as to how to brine turkey. And I didn't even know what brining was and how to cook it afterwards. And, and then we talked about Australian wines. He would have been great for our lunches, Ken, you know, you'd, you'd love him. Um, he was, he was a ter I, I really enjoyed working. He's very, he was intense. Um, but but he was um, committed, passionate, and um, he's a very very fine actor. Very fine actor. And how good's the blacklist? I mean, it's still going. Oh, it's, it's terrific. I mean, just just wonderful. Just wonderful. He was also great in Boston Legal. I, I mean, yes. I've been watching those episodes, and yes, you know, he, he works so well with Bill Shatner. Yeah. And they're, they're a good team, aren't they? What about Shatner? What is he? He's 82 or something. Gosh, he's he's in space. Now he's the official rocket man, he said. Oh, my God. <laughs> How amazing. That's a, that's a, see, there's a man with passion of life, and he enjoys it along the way as well. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a good thing to have. 
Tell us about the awards that you picked up along the way. I haven't got a lot of them. Um, um, and I don't have a lot of them. Um, you know, I, I was I was lucky enough. Um, I didn't get the awards, but Buffalo Girls, uh, there were a number of awards won by people on the production, Emmys and things for Buffalo Girls. Um, I um, uh, won a, Paul Newman and his wife, Joanne Newman, had an award um, and my first TV movie um, that I did with Susan Day, who was in uh, The Partridge Family as a young kid and grew up to be an actress and, and a producer as well. Um, uh, I, the, the Paul, the, the, his son's name, I can't even think of it now. Scott, Scott Newman. Yeah, Scott Newman Award. Uh, we won for this production about uh, cocaine and a mother who thought her baby should be hers and because she was a cocaine addict, the, the, the system took it away from her. Uh, we won an award for that. Um, uh, the December Boys won a, um, an award for the Gaffoni Film Festival, which is an Italian family run uh, um, film festival for December Boys for best, um, best movie. Um, one of my favorites was I got a, um, a Western Heritage Award um, from the Cowboy Hall of Fame um, for uh, Two for Texas with, um, with uh, Tom Skerritt. Um, and uh, I remember going to, the, um, to Oklahoma to, to re receive the award and uh, it's the most extraordinary, um, the, the Western Heritage uh, f uh, Cowboy Museum is just filled with uh, Western art and history. It's just beautiful. And they gave these awards in the middle of the, Tom Selleck was the net was uh, the next on my next table. And um, I'd work with him on a, I was second unit on Simon Winsor, who was another Australian director, been through all the things that we've talked through now and has done, had an amazing career in the United States and is worthy of a chat too at some stage. He did Prisoner, I'm sure he did. Um, yeah. Anyway, he, I did second unit on, on, a, on a Western and Tom Selleck was, was part of that Western. And so we knew each other, but just the chance of being in a, uh, having be worked on a Western film. I'm from Fitzroy, Australia. And I won a Cowboy Hall of Fame Western Heritage Award. That's this bronze statue of a man on a horse that I'm so proud of. I mean, there's something solid that um, that, that made that worthwhile. And uh, if, if I sound like I'm I'm skiting, I'm really not intending to. I really love certain things about what I've done, and I. So it's just passion. And forgive me if you think I'm skiting. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll skite for you. You also picked up a best picture in its category at the 1980 Asian Pacific Film Fest for Thirst. Um, you also, uh, Lies, and, Lies and Lullabies was the Scott Newman Award uh, yeah. and you've been nominated for both Golden Globes and Emmy Awards yes. for movies of, of the week and so forth. Just going back to Tom Selleck, was that movie Quigley Down Under? No, that was shot in Australia, quickly down under. Um, it, it, I, I'm trying to, it was a, it was a TV Western movie uh, based on a series of books. I can't think of the title of it now. It's, uh, uh, Simon was directing it. I was in Australia. Um, um, he had, a, there's a whole bunch of amazing horse stuff and whatever that he asked if I would come over and do the second unit, direct the second unit for him. And because of our history, Simon, I was an assistant director to Simon Winsor. And as I said, probably the worst in the world as an assistant director. But we remained friends. And then to be asked by him to come and direct the big action horse sequences and do stuff with people like Tom Skerritt and uh, others, I, I was honoured to do it. So it was great. Terrific. Up in Calgary as well, and where I, I had done um, or, or was going to, I, no, I had done um, High Noon. So I, it was good going back to, um, back to Calgary. Ooh. Amazing. Fantastic. Is there, um, is there anything you can share with the fans now that you're working on? Anything you can give us an insight to? Oh, you know, goodness me. I, and because of COVID, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm back home in Australia for the first time, full time in, you know, over 30, is it 35? I don't know how many years, uh, too many. Oh, wow. I'm back home where family are, uh, my granddaughters, my sons, my, 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 my friends. And I've got, I've got some really long time, long-term friends. I'm back here enjoying the experience 
um, and and um, enjoying the adventure. And uh, I'm developing a number of productions with my son Brett Hardy, who's also a producer. Uh, we've got a documentary which is out to a very big um, uh, Australian sponsor at the moment. That if they come on board, and we'll know soon. Um, it's it's called Traveling Guitars, and it's the it's kind of part of it's the history of the Tamworth Music Festival, which is celebrating the 50th anniversary next year. And it's the second biggest blue um, country music festival in the world. The, the biggest is Tamworth, uh, is Nashville. Put the words together, Rod. So I've called it Traveling Guitars, but it's it's um, it's from Nashville to Tamworth and back again. Wow. And hopefully I'll have a big country, Australian country performer that will be taking us on that journey. Um, I'm sorry if I'm being vague, but it's a wonderful production. It's about people, country music, country people, and fusing all of these things together. Uh, my son, Brett, is producing it with me. Um, we have another interesting project called the Environmental Symphony, um, which is another interesting, different piece. Um, um, uh, um, a friend, Alan Zavod, composer, Melbourne composer, wrote a symphony and he called it the Environmental Symphony. It was then performed with Sir Richard Branson as a narrator, uh, an orchestra, a 60 piece orchestra with visions of, of um, various things of the crisis on the planet that we know we are all suffering from. And so it's a visual musical event live. And my plan was to get it done at the Hollywood Bowl last year when I went back in March and of course COVID hit and that put it on hold. Um, we've been we're on the journey and another major Amer Australian company uh, may be coming on board and hopefully we'll know more about that toward the end of this year, but it's, it's performed by Richard Branson um, and, and, um, and then I got Jack Thompson to do the narration for it when it was performed in Melbourne it's other time it was performed. Richard Branson is on board with it. I've got my friend Piers Brosnan who's on board with it because he's a, um, a fan of and wants to take care of the planet via the oceans. We were putting together and are putting together up to five because there are five movements of five narrators. And whether we have them on a Zoom screen or they're live on the stage, but the performance will be done somewhere. And I'm hoping it's gonna be done here in Australia. Um, because it's a worthy and a good cause. And this company that's, um, that we're talking with are a very big company, and uh, so we'll see what happens with that. So I've diverted away from the drama side, it appears, but no, that's not true. I'm, I'm involved in some projects now in Australia, um, The Mating Game, which is a wonderful, it's out in the marketplace as far as financing. So until it's financed, there's no point in going into too many details about it but producers on board, distributors that are coming together with it. And, and it's a story about um, how we are all, con it's a romantic comedy in the vein of Bridget Jones's diary, uh, Notting Hill, about how, how we're all connected and including with the animal world. And uh, so there's a wonderful, it's, it's a beautiful comedy written by Shirley Pierce um, and, um, it's right for the times. People coming out of COVID lockdowns are going to want to laugh and enjoy life. And it's a great love story. So that, that's in the works. Um, I've got projects that I, I've got a thing called It's All Greek to Me, which I own the rights to. And it's set uh, in London and in, um, in, um, in Greece. And it's based on a novel. Um, and that is a great, again, romantic comedy, um, which is... <laughs> Fingers crossed, we'll know something about it soon. I've got, I own the rights to a fabulous series of Australian novels written by a writer called Peter Watt. I call the series Dark Frontier. I own 11 of the books in the series. They start in the 1860s and they go through to the 1960s. And it's a family saga, two families, rich, poor, the usual, Catholic, Protestant, angst and ridden and whatever. But it has a wonderful, Game of Thrones mythological indigenous tale right through the center of it. And the indigenous people take charge of the story and maneuver it through the dream time. Um, and it's a wonderful series of books. If anybody uh, wants to hear or read them, um, they're called, the, the first one is called Cry of the Curlew. 
and then they go on. They're written by a man called Peter Watt, and I call the series Dark Frontier. Um, I'm excited about that one too. Other things go on, but you know, I, this, you know th this is an industry where things are on and things are off, and, but you never stop. And that's why COVID's been busy for me. You sleep with all these things? I, oh, easy. <laughs> I have lunch too occasionally when they let me out. <laughs> well, we must do that sometime, Ken. Yes, we must. Guys, that was I hope I've been able to. Thank you so much, Rod. I really appreciate you coming on. That was, uh, yeah. Terrific. Fantastic. Thank you, Rod. That good was on really you both. And Thanks. good luck with your, good luck with your series. I hope it works uh, out. And I, I'm sure you, the fans of Prisoner that you have must um, enjoy hearing some of the tales. I'm sorry that I can't remember the details too much because it was such a long time ago, but there's been so many things happening in life. So anyway, it's all good and it's great, great to have the opportunity. Thank you for thinking of me. Uh, thanks, Rod. Really appreciate Take it. Care. Take care. See you soon. Bye there. Yeah.